tech guy be up here and jump, jump in and if I'm just in this kind of a calm kind of state today. So if I get excited, then that's all right too. But right now, I just want to rest in those songs that were sung by the choir this morning. Didn't they do a good job? God was really speaking to my spirit. We're going to read the scripture first. And um, I just want to say to Pastor Porter, it's so good to have you and Brother Bill back. You look rested. Okay, so um, this is, uh, if you could stand for the reading of this scripture, it's hard to see on the screen, but I'm going to read it here, because I'm reading the easy to read version, and it's from the book of Acts, Acts 8, and it's verses 9 to 25, if you'd like to go to it in your Bible, by asking what some may call an easy question to answer, have you changed? Have you changed? <coughs> You've changed. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've changed. I've changed. I've changed. <laughs> Hopefully for the better. <laughs> Most of us may remember the TV show or the movies that show the main character being transformed. Remember that? I'm thinking about Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, Superman, and others that you can think of. I wish Victor was here because he had a story about Spider-Man. <laughs> they would transform or put on a new face, a new costume, to fight against evil or crime. However, they always converted back to a weaker, less powerful form after they were done. And they hid their true identity. Let me just say, when it comes to superheroes, Christian know, Christians know who their hero is. <laughs> Jesus is our superhero. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. When I look in my, at myself in the mirror, especially in the morning, I see that I have changed. <laughs> I must put on a new face too. As Kerr Franklin says, I have to fix my face change or be transformed. When I try to do a new activity that was a breeze when I was younger, like riding a bike or ice skating, I later feel the change in my arms and in my legs. Yes, we all change physically. Yes. Every day we're growing older. We're slowing down a bit. You can't stop change. With time comes change. We're changing all the time. We might as well embrace it. So take those pictures, stop covering up your face, stop putting your hand like this, smile, because in 10 years when you look back at that picture, you're going to say, gee, I look good, okay? <laughs> Honest. <laughs> I thank God for Sabbath month in July. It is a time when our hearts and minds could focus on the things of God. Amen? Amen. We could see the beauty around us and hopefully impact someone along the way. Those things we sometimes miss when we are in our usual busy activities. Yes, rest, reflection, renewal are all very good for us physically and mentally. And can I add, at this point in my life, I need all the energy I can get to help me chase around those new grand babies. <laughs> transformational spirituality, our theme for this quarter. And I could not find two words together in a definition. So our overall theme, though, as you know, is becoming. And becoming pretty well sums up what transformational spirituality is. We are becoming all what God intends daily. We're being transformed spiritually in the process. But I did find a definition in Wikipedia for transformational leadership. <laughs> that is a style of leadership where a leader works with teams to identify needed change, creating a vision to guide the change through inspiration and executing the change in tandem or cycle with committed members of a group. So I thought maybe I could find a definition, make up my own, or 
discover one within me. So here's, here's the definition. Transformational spirituality. It is a life journey where the leader within the Holy Spirit works on the heart to identify needed change. The Holy Spirit constantly reveals God's vision for the individual's life as the ultimate truth. When tapped into, this truth inspires everlasting, contagious change, meaning others are affected and affected by you, and they too start a transformation. Transformational spirituality happens in those who by faith are committed to the things of God, those things that line up with God's good and perfect will. Amen? Amen. So, the title of my message is the question, are you spiritually contagious? Now, at the beginning of my message, if I would have asked you to turn to someone and say, I'm contagious, <laughs> you would have all cleared over this church and I would have had no one left here. <laughs> <laughs> so, when thinking about transformational spirituality, when preparing the message, my mind thought about the many characters of the Bible who had spiritual transformation through an encounter that changed the way they thought about things. I thought about Paul, or Saul, in the book of Acts, and how he changed his mind about the followers of Christ after he heard the voice of God telling him that he was in fact persecuting the Lord that God and Jesus was one and the same. Or I thought about Philip also in the book of Acts, which tells how a vision came to Philip telling him to take the good news gospel to other people besides those, those ones that he grew up around, the familiar faces. He crossed racial barriers after he listened. So the character that I'm talking about is not as popular as those two, but we're gonna explore Simon, the musician, or as referred to, Simon the sorcerer, not to be confused with Simon who carried the cross for Jesus right. or the other Simons. The scripture is found in the New Testament and it's known as the general history book of Acts. It tells a detailed account of how the Christian church really took off. It was written by a great story writer, Luke, the physician, and an apostle of Jesus. Luke also wrote the gospel of what other gospel did Luke write? Luke. <laughs> the book of Acts, sometimes called the book of the disciples, reads like an adventure novel, packed with the adventures of the apostles as well as other prominent church leaders. The book of Acts should be read after the gospel of Luke, since the writer is the same, and you will feel the flow. There's a lot of good detailed stories there as to how the Holy Spirit moved during Pentecost, how the good news gospel spread, persecution uh, during the early Christians, how they endured it, and how the church was established and how it spread. So I recommend that you study it, read it again and again. This morning, we are, we're reading from Acts chapter 8, verses 9 to 25. And as I mentioned, it's the easy to read version. And you may recall that our Savior Jesus Christ at this point in the Bible had been crucified and has risen and has ascended to the Father where he now sets at the right hand. Before Jesus left though, he taught the apostles everything necessary to continue the work. He promised them a comforter, a helper would come. And Jesus was right. The apostles received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. After that, they too could do miracles that Jesus did in the name of Jesus, continuing his work here on earth and spreading the good news gospel. It was not easy though. There was great persecution because the followers of Jesus were considered a threat to the religious leaders. However, they were peaceful, humble, full of unspeakable joy, and devoted to following the teachings of Jesus. Why? Because they witnessed firsthand that Jesus was the real deal. Jesus was, with, was without a doubt the long-awaited Messiah. So, let's begin. Now, there is a man named Simon who lived in that city before Philip came there. 
Simon had been doing magic and amazing all the people of Samaria. He bragged and called himself a great man. All of the people, the least important and the most important, believed what he said. They said, this man has the power of God that is called the great power. Simon amazed the people with his magic for so long that the people became his followers. Now Philip, the apostle of Jesus, is on his way to Samaria. But before he gets there, something has taken root. Here we have Simon, a man. His real name is Simon Magus, who was planted by Satan to deceive the people. A man who did magic or sorcery, who likely delved in the occult for a long time. It was common back then for wizards and sorcerers with no real power of their own to amaze the crowds for fame and money. Some of us here today enjoy the wonders of a magic show and all its tricks, but we know it's not real. Simon was a wizard and many tricks, with many tricks but no true power. The people were amazed by him, but not enough to be affected by him. Yes, they followed him, but not the way we follow a teacher. They were deceived into thinking that he was something that he was not. The people came to see him, but never asked to be like him. Philip liked to brag too, calling himself great. I'm great, I have great power, he would brag. Likely he had some low self-esteem issues and needed the gratification of the people. It was obvious that Simon liked being on top. He liked people looking up to him. He had them all believing him from every walk of life too. The people even thought he had the power of God. They did not know God, the big G yet. This little G God was the center of attraction, but not attracting real change in the people. Simon was hiding behind pretense, trickery, and lies. To the people, he was just a spectacle, unlike Jesus, who was the main attraction, attracting people to become like him. Verse 12. But Philip told the people the good news about God's kingdom and the power of Jesus Christ. Men and women believed Philip and were baptized. Simon himself also believed, and after he was baptized, he stayed close to Philip. When he saw the miraculous signs and powerful things Philip did, he was amazed. In comes one of Jesus' disciples, Philip, who did not tell the people how great he was. He told the people how great Jesus was. He did not point a magic wand. He pointed them to Jesus, away from himself. Philip was on a mission for the king, King Jesus. When the Lord is with you, who can be against you? Amen. This scripture says that both men and women believed that day and were baptized. The message Philip gave had to do with repenting, believing, and being baptized because the people were baptized. And look at that, Simon too also believed and was baptized. Simon had no power over the work of God, though. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Simon received no special treatment either. He treated Simon like all the other believers. Good. Simon had to have been searching for something more because the scripture says that he stayed close to Philip. Simon was following a man of God. You could say Simon got a taste and wanted more. Likely when he saw Philip cast out some evil spirits, heal paralyzed people, and those who were sick or lame, Simon was amazed. Simon, the one who earlier bragged to call himself great or having great power, was amazed by the things of God. Simon knew in his heart he could not do what Philip did. There was no bag of tricks. The one who once said he was great was now amazed. Verse 14. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted the word of God. So they sent Peter and John to the people of Samaria. When Peter and John arrived, they prayed for the Samaritan believers to receive the Holy Spirit. 
these people had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but the Holy Spirit had not yet come on down on any of them. This is why Peter and John prayed. When the two apostles laid their hands on people, they received the Holy Spirit. Now the church is spreading. The news spread to Jerusalem that the people of Samaria had accepted the word of God. Jerusalem was thrilled. So they sent Peter and John, who prayed that the Holy Spirit would enter into the hearts and souls of these believing people, including Simon. Yes, they accepted the word, were baptized in Jesus' name, but they had not received the Holy Spirit at that time. Peter and John did not say abracadabra or have a magic wand or a stick. What did they do? The scripture says they prayed for the Holy Spirit to come upon these believers in the name of Jesus. The power of prayer. Praise God. They also felt it necessary to lay hands on the people, including Simon, and the Holy Spirit did come upon them. Verse 18, Simon saw that the, the Spirit was given to the people when the apostles laid their hands on them, so he offered the apostles money. He said, give me this power so that when I lay hands on someone, they will receive the Holy Spirit. This is where Simon gets changed and strange. Did he ever miss a day? He saw what was given to the people by the laying on of hands, and he too also received the Holy Spirit himself, but yet he wanted to buy some of the power of the apostles' head so that he could lay hands on the people so they would receive the Holy Spirit from him. <laughs> it does not say this, but I believe Simon likely changed, uh, wanted to charge the money too. <laughs> He's backslidden already. Backslidden, just got saved and backslidden already. Looking for another act to add to his tricks. Simon wanted Holy Ghost power, but did not want to work on the power he had been given. Simon wanted to be the great one and miss the greatness placed inside of him. He wanted it quick and he wanted it now. Instead of being grateful for the touch, Simon wanted the apostles touch for himself. He did not allow the Holy Spirit to work on him. He wanted to work against the Holy Spirit. He asked a question, and that showed his true motive, showed his true intent. He may have started out with the right motive, but he let Satan speak those same lies that made him a prisoner of Satan before. You can be great. Buy it for yourself. Use money. They will take it. He was only following Philip to seize an opportunity to make himself rich and popular. Instead of following Philip, he should have been following God. Simon wanted what he could not tap into, but Simon heard the word. Simon believed. He was baptized. Instead of going forward in the Holy Spirit, he converted back to his old ways. Reading verse 20. Peter said to Simon, you and your money should both be destroyed because you thought you could buy God's gift with money. You cannot share with us in this work. Your heart is not right before God. Change your heart. Turn away from these evil thoughts and pray to the Lord. Maybe he will forgive you. I see that you are full of bitter jealousy and cannot stop yourself from doing wrong. So Peter suggested that perhaps Simon and his money should be destroyed for saying such a thing. Peter could not do it himself, or perhaps he would have done it right there and then. Peter rebuked Simon hard. Peter knew that only Almighty God could destroy Simon if God wanted to. So he told Simon that this is the Lord's work and he will not be a part of it. This was not Simon's call to lay hands on people. He's still on milk, wanting the meat too fast. <laughs> then Peter told him what the root of the problem was. He said, the problem was Simon's heart and that it needed to be changed. Now that you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you can change your heart. You have some bitter jealousy in you 
and you have no self-control. You're doing wrong. It's easy for you to do wrong. Change your heart, man. Change your heart. Make your heart right before God. In other words, Peter was telling Simon to repent. Ask God to remove that bitter jealousy and give you some self-control. Get, get right with God and do it now. Maybe God, by his grace and mercy, will forgive you. You will notice that the entire time, Peter is pointing to God and never to himself. Verse 24, Simon answered, Both of you pray to the Lord for me, so that what you have said will not happen to me. In his heart, Simon knew that they were right. We called him Simon the Sorcerer, but he was in this scripture as it started, Simon the Man. We are not defined by our lifestyles. We are not, say, Debbie the Prostitute, or Debbie the Sinner, or Debbie the Drug Dealer. I'm Debbie the Woman. I am a child of the Lord. And so are you. So conviction came over him. He did what every God-fearing new believer who was just told about himself would do. I want not, uh, I want not one, <laughs> but two of you to pray for me. Not one, but two. You see, Simon believed in the Lord, and he knew that these men had tapped into something greater than he. Someone that was greater and more powerful than any magic trick that he ever did. More powerful than Satan, who had him trapped in a sea of jealousy. Still, not fully understanding his new life in Christ enough to, uh, so he asked them to pray for him, that none of these things that they said would happen to him. Simon did not want to go to hell. He did not want to be destroyed. This showed that Simon had humbled himself before God, and I believe his spiritual transformation kicked in at that time. The same man who some time ago bragged about how great he was, now was filled with reverence for God. Verse 25, then the two apostles told the people what they had seen Jesus do. They told them the message of the Lord. Then they went back to Jerusalem. On the way, they went through many Samaritan towns and told people the good news. It says then. It didn't say years later. It said then. The apostles responded by telling the people, including Simon, what they saw Jesus do when he was with them. I imagine they spoke about the wonders that Jesus did as recorded in the book of healing the sick and afflicted, casting out demons, made the lame walk, the blind see, gave hope to those considered outcasts and the widows, setting the captives free, speaking and teaching in parables, loving everyone, how Jesus handled temptation, how he fasted, how he prayed to his father, and how he sacrificed his life for the entire world, saved and unsaved, and how he rose from the dead. The apostles told the messages from Jesus too, it says, what was one of the messages? I believe it was that forgiveness of sins be preached in the name of Jesus to all nations. They could have said many things, but I think, I like to think it was for them to spread the good news gospel to all nations. That it's your turn to use what's in you to spread the word, to tell somebody, to tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord, to be a witness that Jesus took our sins to the cross, bearing our shame. No condemnation. They shared the way the message is spread through every believer by the power of the Holy Spirit within you. <laughs> now it doesn't say what happened to Simon after that, but some reports say Simon changed that day for the better and went on to live a life in Samaria that was pleasing to God. Because once you encounter Jesus, no matter who you are, you could be the worst sinner of all. You are never, ever the same. You could think you are the worst sinner because no one's the worst sinner. We know those who have come through something horrific 
have a testimony to, to tell. Simon may have been one of those people that had a big testimony after that. Proving that even those who slip and fall back into sin after they believe and are baptized can be restored by God when they repent and turn from sin. There is hope for those with stunted spiritual growth. We are all on a path of becoming, and it is never too late to become spiritually transformed while you have breath in your body. Not just being hearers of the word, but doers of the word also. Are you and I trying to live a life that reflects who Jesus is? Are we witnesses of what he is doing in our lives today? Not when you accepted the Lord way back 100 years ago. <laughs> what about right now? What about now? Get contagious for Christ. Kindness goes a long way. Gentleness and self-control. Our Holy Spirit has the answers. We just need to tap into it, ask Him, and He will help us every time. I guarantee it. Amen. So I talked to you uh, about the physical changes that we're experiencing. There's a part of us that continually needs to be transformed daily so that we can become contagious in a positive way. Get rid of rebellion, envy, hate, and lust, and other things that mean you no good. It is no good for you and I, and no good for those around us. Replace it with real fruit, the fruits of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. With those, you can be a witness in the world, becoming contagious for Christ. We can pray more, we can study the Bible more, we can learn new things, we can read and meet people from all walks of life and hear their stories. I found this slide while I was searching by Stephen Lewis and it says, the world needs you, the world needs you, so get out there and be spiritually contagious. Show them the fruit of the Holy Spirit within you. I thought that was very fitting what God has in store for us. God needs some Christian soldiers who are willing to stand against the evils of society. You only have to turn on the news, Facebook, or walk around and know what you need to pray for. But pray. Don't leave downhearted and don't leave defeated. Brothers and sisters, as believers, you and I have the power within us to change the course of an event. So please pray for God's will to be done. None of us have all the answers to life's questions, and God didn't ask us to. However, God wants us to be his witnesses in the world and come to him often in prayer. If there is something or someone holding you back from following Jesus fully, you know what you need to do. Change your ways, repent, and invite Jesus Christ into your heart. We become complete and our witness becomes contagious so that people we encounter may see the change and catch a glimpse of what a relationship with Jesus looks like and feels like. That is the Spirit-filled, led life by the Holy Spirit, spiritually transformed for good. Not just good, but everlasting good for good till eternity. So, I ask that if you heard this message this morning, and if it spoke to you, and you've been stagnant, you've been, you know, just not using what God has placed inside of you, this call is for you. Come on to the altar. It's also for those that have not made that walk to Jesus. He stands at the door and he knocks at our hearts. And he says, come, open the door. Open the door of your heart. I want to come in. Jesus is right at the door of our heart and he waits for us to open the door. He doesn't force himself on us. 
He asks that we just open the door and let him in. Just a taste, just a touch, that's all you need. It doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what your life looks like or what it looked like in the past. That doesn't matter, really. We've all got a story. But Jesus says, come, come as you are. Accept me today. Accept that I can bring you life. Life anew. You don't have to stress about this and stress about that because I took those burdens to the cross a long time ago. I carried them to the cross. 